Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown, the skeptical show where we shit on mysteries. Welcome, this is time travel. That's not real. I mean, time travel's definitely real. We're all traveling in time right now into the future at approximately one second per second. Yes, that's right. Time travel with Charlotte and Eleanor. The Mobley Jordan incident. Thank you, Katie, for writing this. Thank you, me, for reading it. And thank you, dear listener, for being here. Anything for you. And if this episode is sponsored, thanks to our sponsor who keep my coffee cup full, my pockets heavy. That's a lie. Uh, who carries change anymore? So heavy, I don't have to worry about change. Ha! No, I do have a giant cup filled with coins that I never seem to get rid of. Have you ever felt you've accidentally stepped into a situation that you weren't supposed to be in? There are things like walking into a room when people have obviously been talking about you and there's a palpable tension in the air or you might barge in on someone doing something they thought was private and you hastily back away. Then there might be situations where you turn a corner and you get a weird feeling like this is definitely somewhere you shouldn't be. Or maybe like the <laughs> it's like those times that like, I don't know it's happened a couple of times in my life where you're desperate for a pee and you're like ah oh, toilets thank god and you burst inside you're like wait where are the urinals is that a woman oh god what have i done oh god what have i done you know what i mean men and maybe ladies you've walked in there and you're like why are the urinals oh i see i've made an error or maybe like the main characters in today's story, you feel a sense of unease and anxiety as you wander through some slightly unnatural surroundings before finally making your way back out the other side. The events covered in this episode are known variously as the ghosts of Petit Trianon, the ghost of Versailles, the Meubles de Jojon incident, and perhaps a one that gives it away the most, the Versailles time slip. Thanks to the person with the YouTube handle, Tear Shell, for this suggestion. See, we do read the comments sometimes. I always read the comments. I mean, not always. I have to say this week I haven't read the comments at all, but normally I do. Like, just the top comments, just the good ones, the ones that get, you know, thumbs up to the top. And then I'm like, I'll have a look at those, see if anyone's got any good suggestions, and uh, yeah. I mean, it makes my life easier, because then I'll see a suggestion and be like, bomb, thank you very much. Uh, unlike Katie, I don't really ever give credit, because I'm kind of like, I don't know. It's really hard to make that logistically work, because there's such a big process from like me dumping that idea into like the project management software. One of the writers picking it up and then writing it, and then it's just not, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The incident. In 1901, Charlotte Ann Moberly was the first principal of the newly founded Women's College St. Hughes, which was part of the University of Oxford. A well-educated, intelligent woman, she visited Paris in August of that year with her friend and fellow big-brained academic, Eleanor Jourdain. Jourdain had received a doctorate for research that had done into the works of Dante, and later in her career she had become vice-principal of St. Hughes under Moberly, and took over the position of principal after Moberly's retirement in 1915. It wasn't for any academic Academic achievements that the two became best known, however, it was for a little book published in 1911 with the title An Adventure. Anyway, more on that in a bit. Let's go back to 1901 and a trip to Paris. On the 10th of August, 1901, the pair took a train to Versailles to check out the palace and its grounds after moseying around the palace for a little bit. They decided to explore the gardens and head for the Petit Trianon. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing these French things correctly. I'm just trying to like read the words with a French accent and just kind of hope that works. So uh, I apologize, French people. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, which was built originally for Louis. Nah, it's Louis. Louis the Fifteenth's mistress, Madame de Pompadour, and later became Marie Antoinette's personal domain. It's quite away from the main palace, and Mobley and Jourdain, having, while having checked a map beforehand, got a bit disorientated. So far, so relatable, ladies. I personally have what Chitty from the TV show The Good Place refers to as directional insanity, so there's no judgement from me over there. I love The Good Place. I have to say, I'm probably a few seasons behind that. It's such a good TV show. I don't know why I'm not up to date with that. Should get on that. They're still making it, I hope. In their book that was later published, called An Adventure, Jordan says that it was her idea to walk down a random path because it looked like it might be the right way to go. Mobley caught sight of a woman shaking a cloth out of a window as they passed a small building on the corner, but neither woman spoke to her. As they walked along this road, they started feeling a difference in the air, described in their book as dreariness, an eerie feeling, oppressive and an extraordinary depression. As they continued along, they met a pair of men dressed in what seemed like some sort of official garb with three cornered hats and long grey-green coats. 
They spoke to these men, who told them to carry straight on to get to the Petit Trianon. Jourdain later noted that they spoke in an oddly mechanical way, and when she had asked for directions again to double check, they'd answered in exactly the same way. Jourdain then noticed a woman and a girl standing in a doorway wearing old fashioned clothing. The woman was handing the girl a jug, but they were both oddly posed and still as though in a painting. Nobody then had the feeling that everything they saw was somehow artificial. Writing in an adventure, Everything suddenly looked unnatural, therefore unpleasant. Even the trees behind the building seemed to have become flat and lifeless, like a woodworked in tapestry. There were no effects of light and shade. No wind stirred the trees. It was all intensely still. Both women then walked past what's described as a kiosk, which I think is a gazebo or a little pavilion thing, and nearby was a man who they both got really malevolent vibes from. <laughs> It's like vibes feels like such a modern word to be used in 1901. That dude gives me the bad vibes, my dear. <laughs> he is filled with the vibes of badness. Jourdain described their encounter as follows. The man slowly turned his face, which was marked by smallpox. His complexion was very dark. The expression was very evil and yet unseeing. And though I did not feel that he was looking particularly at us, I felt a repugnance to going past him. Similarly, Mobley reported, The man's face was repulsive, its expression odious. His complexion was very dark and rough. It sounds like you're just like shaming him because he's so covered in smallpox scars. Which feels a bit, I mean, it was 1901, but if that feels a bit, a bit intense, doesn't it? Shouldn't we be more, a bit more sensitive to a man who's been disfigured by a horrible disease, rather than, his face was repugnant. <laughs> I got bad vibes from him because he was so disgusting. <laughs> The two ladies hurried past and suddenly heard someone calling out to them. Another man rushed up to them and told them in French that they shouldn't go the direction they were headed, that they needed to go another way to find the house. They then crossed a little bridge over a stream and finally came around to the Petit Trianon. As they approached, Mobley saw a woman in an old-fashioned dress doing some sketching. The woman looked at them as they passed and Mobley thought she was probably another tourist, even though her dress was a bit odd for the time. As they walked up to the terrace, a young man came out of a door which banged shut behind him. He escorted them round to the proper entrance of the house and gave Jourdain the impression that he was mocking them. Finally reaching their destination, the weird atmosphere Mobley and Jourdain had been experiencing lifted and they joined another group of tourists looking around Petit Trianon. While they didn't really talk about their experience at the time, about a week later, Mobley remembered the strange feeling of dreamy, unnatural oppression and asked her friend if she thought the Petit Trianon might be haunted. <laughs> Do you remember last week we were hanging out in Paris? Do you think it was haunted, my dear? Do you guys get this overwhelming sense of death? Okay. Jordan said yes. Oh, yes, I do think it was all rather good. Pip pip. And they discussed their walk a bit, but neither thought much of it, and they didn't bring up the subject of ghosts, as they were more interested in the feelings they had around the place than what they had seen. Another three months on, Jordan visited Mobley, and they got to reminiscing about their trip again. This time, when Mobley mentioned the woman sitting there sketching and that they should have asked her for directions, Jordan said that they'd never seen anyone at all sitting there. As it became clear that their experiences had not been identical, both women wrote their own personal accounts of the walk and compared notes. It seems that while both experienced the physical landscape in the same way, both seeing the kiosk, the little bridge, etc., Jordan didn't see the woman shaking the cloth out at the start of the walk and Mobley didn't see the woman in the girl and the girl strange in the strangely posed to blow. Jourdain hadn't seen the sketching woman, but had a feeling that there were people around her that she couldn't see. They both appear to have seen all the men that popped up. When Jourdain started talking to another friend about the possibility that the Petit Trianon was haunted, the friend mentions that the ghost of Marie Antoinette had been seen before, and it turns out that the day they had visited, the 10th of August, was the anniversary of the insurrection of the French Revolution, which led to the end of the monarchy in France. Both women went back to visit Versailles, Jourdain several times, and couldn't find the bridge or the so-called kiosk that they'd gone past the first time. The whole area leading to the Petit Trianon was in fact different. Things like a plow that Jourdain had seen were no longer there, and the door that had banged shut behind the young man was part of a chapel that was in a state of ruin, the door of which had been opened for at least 15 years. Both women dived into researching both the Palace of Versailles and French history in general, and came to the conclusion that due to clothing, political and social happenings, and the layout of the grounds of Versailles at the time, they had in fact been seeing things as they were in about 1789 and no later than 1792. That is three years, that's very specific. Also, they're writing a book about this, and they called it An Adventure. It just sounds like this is a backstory to a book that they've decided to publish as, like, fa uh, factual, because 
if you label a fictional book as factual and it's got time travel, people, it's probably going to sell better. It's going to be a better story, which is exactly what this feels like. A story. None of this is real. Mobley identified the woman sketching as Marie Antoinette herself, and the scary pockmarked man was thought to be the Comte de Vaudreuil. Sorry, son. Yeah, no, I just guessed. Vaudreuil. Vaudreuil. I just I just guessed at the pronunciation, Katie. I'm sorry for that, French people. A frequent hanger-on at the Petit Trianon, a bit of an antagonist towards Marie Antoinette. It's kind of nebulous if they believe they had seen ghosts or, as Mobley theorized, had somehow slipped into a memory of Marie Antoinette, but they were both 100% sure that they'd entered the past in some way. So you've, uh, you've entered a memory of Marie Antoinette, that's even more absurd than time travel. How do you enter someone's memory? Not to mention that person's memories were, were, were dead many years ago when her head was chopped off. Like, they didn't survive past that. After having spent a decade researching all aspects of their experience to confirm that they had been in the past, the book An Adventure was published under the pseudonyms of Elizabeth Morrison for Charlotte Mobley and Francis Lamont for Eleanor Jourdain. The book was a hit and several editions were published, with the real authors being identified in 1931. Jourdain had already died several years earlier by this point and Mobley died in 1937. Their account is often referred to as a prominent example of people experiencing a time slip or somehow entering the past. And a TV movie was made in 1981 called Miss Morrison's Ghost, which at its current 7 on IMDb might be worth a watch one of these days. Yeah, I'm gonna give this one a pass. <laughs> no thank you. I'm not here for that. Some possible explanations. The main point, holding up the women's version of events, is that as prominent academics and educators, they would have a lot to lose both professionally and personally should they suddenly come out with the story of having jaunted about in the 18th century for about an hour or so with Marie Antoinette. Which which doesn't help their story because they published under pseudonyms for a reason. While their book was popular, it also opened them up to a whole heap of derision and ridicule, which is not what a couple of middle-aged ladies in Edwardian England are all about. Because of the depth of the research they carried out to ascertain what they'd seen, many people hold up their story as an important example of time slips, time travel, and paranormal goings on in general. So let's take a look at some of the theories of what could possibly explain their strange tale. I see that the first title here is, It really was a time slip! It's a short two paragraphs, so let's be patient. Did Mobley and Jourdain actually travel back in time to Versailles as it was in the late 18th century? It would definitely be worth writing about if they had. Unfortunately, the only evidence we have about this time travel comes from the book An Adventure. There isn't anything else to go on, apart from a few throwaway comments about other people having seen Marie Antoinette's ghost about the place. If there was some kind of portal or rift in time on the grounds of Versailles, I think more people would have come across it, being that millions of tourists go there every year. Yeah, it's, come on, come on, come on! In their book, Mobley and Jourdain didn't explicitly mention time travel, and as there's been no proven cases of people genuinely traveling backwards in time, let's just assume that that's not what happens. Sorry to give this theory such short shrift, but it's kind of hard to research, and the women themselves don't believe they physically jumped back in time via some time-traveling device, so let's just crack on. Good. No one believes this. It's idiotic. I just can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. It was something possibly even less believable. Less believable than time travel, huh? Time travel with aliens, maybe? I don't know. Let's go. So if Mobley and Jourdain didn't travel back in time, could the past have bled through to their present? I've heard stories of people who are just going about their business when, for example, a group of World War I soldiers suddenly blows past them or they hear sounds of large events or battles that are not really there. Those people are people who need to see a psychiatrist. My own mother said she was woken up during the night when we were staying in a hotel and she thought the metal coat hangers were banging around inside the wardrobe. She didn't investigate, of course, she just went back to sleep. In the morning, she discovered that there weren't any metal coat hangers in the wardrobe and we later found out that duels had been held on the site. And it might have been the sound of a sword fighting she heard. Or, or she could have heard something that's actually real. <laughs> like, I don't know, rattling around or something in an air vent. Like hotels all have that big central air. Could have been something rattling around in there, you know. That's, you know, something that's real. On the 10th of August, 1972, the same day over a hundred years before the ladies went to Paris, the Tuileries Palace was stormed, leading to the deaths of hundreds of Swiss guards and civilians. The royal family fled the palace and the monarchy was formally abolished a few weeks later on the 21st of September, 1792. Could such a politically and emotionally charged time have imprinted itself on the very fabric of the gardens of Versailles? Mobley seems to think that somehow they found themselves in a memory of Marie Antoinette from that time, and the man running up to them was in fact someone running to warn the Queen 
of the coming revolutionaries. The only problem with this theory is that, as we just said, it was the Tuileries Palace that was besieged, not Versailles. As the crow flies, these palaces were over 10 miles or 16 kilometers apart. Obviously, by road, it would be further. Marie Antoinette was in the Tuileries that day, so if it was a memory, it was from an earlier time. Mobley also suggested that maybe it was Marie Antoinette just reminiscing in general about her time in Versailles and the Petit Trianon. This would explain the strangeness they felt at being there and the artificial nature of some of the settings. So ridiculous. It's a story they made up and wrote in a book to make some money under a pseudonym. Why do we... This is, and this is, this is why. Like, why would you do that? Because look, we're still talking about it 100 years later. 120 years later. It's crazy. I mean, I should, I should do this. <laughs> As I'll make some money. Make up a story of time travel, sell it to the History Channel. It also might explain the scary man with the scarred face. The women's research identified him as the Comte de Vaudreuil and variously described as having a dark complexion, having smallpox scars, and generally giving off an air of evil. This is at odds with all portraits of the Count, who is shown as having light skin. The women found that he was Creole during their research, which is why they matched him with the dark-skinned man they saw. He wasn't dark-skinned in real life, though, with his father being white and his mother being white Creole. He did apparently have smallpox scars, though, and it took me ages to find any references to them, so I don't think they were that bad. He seemed to be a social climber, maybe an affair with Marie Antoinette's best friend, but in general, the Queen herself didn't like him very much. He had more or less tricked her into getting the anti-establishment play, The Marriage of Figaro, performed, which didn't go down well with the king. So maybe his physical appearance in Moberly and John Ayn's experience was a manifestation of the queen's feelings towards him, not what he actually looked like in real life. Also, how do we explain the fact that the two women actually interacted with people in the scene? Could they potentially have slipped into two other characters that were present within the memory? Are we thinking too much about this? Yes, absolutely we are! Quite possibly. So let's move on to some other theories. When are we going to get to the theory that they made this up? It's going to be the last one. It was a folie a deux. Yes, more French terms. If you didn't know, a folie a deux can be defined as a sort of shared madness or delusion. Boom! Yes. The American Psychological Association defines it as a rare psychotic disorder in which two intimately related individuals simultaneously share similar or identical delusions. Intimately related, you're saying? Here's where a bit of gossip enters the mix. At the time of the incident, Mobley was 54 and Jordan was 37. They both knew each other and later worked at the same college. Neither of them were married and, of course, rumors swirled about their relationship. In bold terms, this folie du theory comes down to people saying that they were lesbian in it up all over the place, which then caused them to both share a psychotic delusion while wandering around the grounds of Versailles. <laughs> it's like, they are women! Lesbian women! It must be hysteria! <laughs> Ah, the past, everybody. While I don't believe they somehow entered Marie Antoinette's memory, I also do not believe they were both experiencing some sort of shared madness. I think they were both experiencing some sort of shared profit from a book, yes! For one thing, it's all pretty tame. They didn't even know what they were experiencing was that weird until they finally talked about it later and realized they had seen different things. Also, they weren't whipped up into some sort of emotional frenzy at the time. They were literally walking around sightseeing in a very popular tourist spot. At the most, they were a little uneasy that they might have taken the wrong path, but neither of them was in distress. Personally, I think this theory is just a bit sensational and wants to cast the pair as having some sort of sordid affair. I don't know if they ever were in a romantic relationship. You can find lurid theories about this all over the place, but even if they were, I don't think it really has anything to do with what they say happened in the book. This they may have both bought into the possible time slip theory just from prior experience, though. Both women readily admit in their book, although under their false names, do having physical psychical psychical gifts sorry this different from physical gifts but it looks so similar in writing in their families and also having family members who possessed powers of premonition accompanied by vision don't ask them what they think of the occult though as this goes off into a powerful rant and where you end up thinking that perhaps they are protesting a tad too much. Anyway, while there are some people that just write this episode off as a shared delusion, albeit kind of a boring one, there are still other theories that are not based in a spirit in the spirit or psychic world. Yeah, I don't think it was this. I don't think it's some shared delusion. I just think they wrote just, they just wrote a fiction book. They just wrote a fiction book and they called it nonfiction to get people to talk about it more. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. All these other theories are dog. It was a total drag show. 
Yes, it's possible that the pair inadvertently wandered into a private party with real-life 1901 men dressed up in all period costumes, including Marie Antoinette. Think this is unlikely? Yes, there was a French poet of illustrious lineage, sort of a combination of Lord Byron Oscar Wilde called Robert de Mont Montesquieu, or to give him his full title, Marie Joseph Robert Anatole de Montesquieu. Okay, he's got a long French name. There we go. M J R A D M F. That's his. That's that's the the his name is initials easier a darling of the parisian literary and art scene he lived on the avenue de paris a stone's throw from the versailles paris and was in love with the visual aesthetics of the grounds he was known to throw elaborate garden parties and costume balls including at least one where everybody had to dress as members of the royal court his aim was often to create more of a living tableau than a party to sort of turn the occasion into a work of art in itself so is it too far of a stretch to imagine that two not very worldly English ladies might have stumbled into a slice of gay Parisian life that and just not had a clue what to make of it. Oh my god, how deep do these ridiculous theories go? This theory, or a similar one where the pair came across a historical reenactment group of some sort, has been quite popular. For some, this is a definitive case closed. Art historian Dame Joan Evans owns the copyright to an adventure and after hearing the theory about the tableau vivant and robert de Mosso she declared the mystery officially solved and stopped further editions of the book from being published what did she not like money come on <laughs> yeah it does seem like a rational explanation to the event the two ladies might subconsciously have picked up on vibes that they weren't well that weren't welcome and that's why everything felt strange however being from the academic world of course they thought of this as a possible explanation too not the gay men in drag bit but the historical reenactment bit according to jordan there was a list of parties and stuff happening at versailles and there had been an event where people dressed up in the era of louis the 16th but that had been a month before in a different area of the grounds there's nothing listed for august 1901 because the layout of the area they passed through matched how it would have looked in 1792 jordan also questioned why people would bother moving rocks to places they hadn't been in over a hundred years and if it was part of a photo or film scene why nothing was actually happening so that leaves us with one main theory we're finally there katie we did it yes <laughs> it's all a fraud i wouldn't call it fraud it's just fiction it's just they made it up it's not complicated oh god i'm so tired whether they did it on purpose or not were the events of the mobile jordan incident just a case of a couple of doors getting a bit mixed up i'm of the opinion and i think a lot of people agree with me that both mobile and jordan actually believe they had somehow slipped back in time no i don't believe this the contents of an adventure are not consciously made up and they didn't set out to try and dupe anyone they presented their story as they remembered experiencing it and then they took all the criticism that came with it well sort of as i said before to protect themselves personally and professionally they used pseudonyms and jordan died before their true identities ever came to light why do why did they why why naturally jump to they believed it when we can naturally jump to their frauds <laughs> I just feel like for both of them to have the same delude, maybe they had some like funky lunch or something. Maybe they both took a little bit of the magic mushrooms, you know? They got that psilocybin rolling or something. And then they both had different like little, little trips or whatever. But I don't believe that they just had like some sort of, they both had the same delusion that they believed to be a time slip. And then they got back and they compared notes and they wrote a book about it. I just don't believe that. I just don't think, I just think the most likely thing is humans like money and they wanted some money so they wrote a book and they called it fact i've said this like 700 times god damn am i skeptical or what here's a skeptical view of what might have actually happened mobile and jordan got lost wandering around the grounds of a sigh and totally misremembered where they had been in subsequent visits they had not found areas of the grounds as they were in the 1700s they were just in a different area to where they thought they were it would take almost half an hour to walk from the palace to the petit chanon plenty of time to get a bit off track the ground of a size over 800 hectares whoa which is nearly two and a half times the size of new york central park so it's very likely they were somewhere else and new york central park is surprisingly massive i've been to new york i've been to central park and i was blown years ago i was blown away by how big it was it's like holy shit, this is this was be if they built a, a skyscraper it'd be worth a fortune look at all this land just going to waste <laughs> 
At the time of the so-called incident, they didn't have any inkling that they had potentially gone back in time, or that people, the people they saw were ghosts or anything like that. They felt a strange atmosphere, but that was about it. They didn't even mention it to each other at the time it came out after further discussion. And here's where we can see the events take on a life of their own. There were several editions of An Adventure published, which embellished upon the story and details each time. It's impossible to accurately recall things 100%. People's memories are notoriously unreliable. Every time you access a memory, it changes, and you're basically remembering a memory of a memory. The first edition didn't come out until ten years after their walk, and there's no way their memories of the events would have been uncompromised during this decade. Wait a minute! It took them ten years? Oh my, for some reason I thought it was super quickly afterwards, like they wrote it down and they wrote a book. Okay, that does change things a little bit. That does make it more likely they had some weird experience, and they, like, hyped each other up for ten years and then decided to write about it, I thought it was much sooner afterwards for some reason. Um, okay, so I, I will, I do still think they just made it up, but I will say that the idea that they had some odd experience and then hyped each other up over 10 years just became way more likely in my opinion. The description of events given by both women in the first edition are markedly shorter and lacking in detail than the events as presented in later editions. They <laughs> just embellished it out. The more they researched, the more it probably shaped the memories of what they thought they saw. Sure, things like Jordane not seeing the so-called Marie Antoinette seem odd, but maybe she didn't literally see her because she was looking at something else, or a friend was in between them, or she just wasn't paying attention. It happens all the time. And speaking of Central Park, even though it was a few sentences ago, I lived in Manhattan for a couple of years and once asked my husband if the jeff coons sculpture was still outside the rockefeller center which he literally walked past every day for work and he had no idea and had never even noticed it so yeah i'm not convinced that one person seeing something that the other didn't is enough evidence to confirm that time travel occurred or that the mystery person was a ghost agreed nobody in particular was very detailed in her descriptions especially of the woman's dress weirdly detailed in fact almost as though she had later seen a picture of marie internet and then transpose those details onto the woman in her memory or if we were rolling with my theory that she saw that dress and then she was like let's put that in the story that we made up I still think it's more likely they just made this all this shit up. If I walked past a woman in a dress, I might be able to remember the main color or pattern and possibly the style, but this woman was supposedly sitting down, so even working that out was a bit hard. And the two women didn't even write down their accounts immediately after it happens. They didn't do that for another three months. Now, I don't know about you, but I can barely remember what I did at the weekend. Never mind the dress someone was wearing when I walked past them three months ago. Yeah, there's zero chance. But here's what Mobley said about the woman sitting with the sketch pad. Her light summer dress was arranged on her shoulders in handkerchief fashion, and there was a little line of either green or gold near the edge of the handkerchief, which showed me that it was over, not tucked into a bedice, which was cut low. Her dress was long-waisted and with a good deal of fullness in the skirt, which seemed to be short. Later she says, again, I saw the lady this time from behind and noticed her Fichu, 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 fichu was pale green. A fichu is a, a fichu is a triangular shawl, by the way. Thank you, Katie. So yeah, lots remembered there. Maybe this was just a random tourist, or maybe a tableau vivant, or a reenactment of some kind that wasn't officially in the books. I mean, you have people dressing up in all kinds of crap that go to Disney. I'm sure some bands of Marie Antoinette style pop up at Versailles from time to time. But these ladies were professionals. They were highly educated. Oh, why would they make this stuff up? It must have happened. This is the main point in favor of the events being real. Well, as Brian Dunning of Skeptoid says, respected academics they may have been and well-intentioned to boot, but no one is above being mistaken or above susceptibility to preconceived notions and all manner of perceptual errors. Brian is being generous. I mean, yes, of course, possible. Do I think they I still think they made it all up? Hell yeah. Absolutely. Mobley also had other visions, and in 1914 saw a man in a toga and a gold crown in the Louvre of all places, so she thought was Charmaine at the time, but later decided it was Constantine, the Roman Emperor instead. I guess you would only notice famous dead people, as you probably wouldn't recognize anybody normal. Anyway, both women admitted to other brushes with spirit, so maybe they were just more susceptible to believing that that was what they had seen. Or, or maybe they were like clairvoyant, and this was an indicator that they could see into the spirit world. 
size. Other people might just thought, have thought, oh look, a big guy in a crown and a toga. Best avoid him, he looks like a twat. Or, hmm, I can see a very tall man in a crown and a toga in a public place. Am I having a hallucination or some type of mental breakdown? If I saw a man wearing a toga and wearing a crown, I'd be like, what is that dude up to? And then if he just vanished, like, whew, in a puff of smoke, I'd be like, I need to see a doctor. <laughs> uh, actually, I probably wouldn't. I'd be like, whoa, my brain just had a big ass fart. But then if it started happening regularly, I'd be like, I gotta go to the brain doctor. <laughs> Hopefully it's not a tumor. Oh god, don't joke. I for one would not assume I'd had a vision of a dead Roman emperor, and to be honest, I'd be hard pressed to recognize anyone from that era, apart from possibly Julius Caesar. If Charmaine appeared before me, I'd have no idea who he was. Sorry, Charmaine. Okay, I've looked him up now. Kinda looks like a guy with a beard. Hey, a bit like Simon with no glasses. I am the reincarnation of Charmaine. And every time I say this, the people are like, Simon, it's pronounced Charlemagne. And I'm like, you're mistaken, because it is Charmaine. So there you go. A walk through the palace grounds ended in a couple of ladies getting lost and writing themselves into infamy. The main takeaway I got from all of this was that it's an important example of an unexplained paranormal event, and it was pretty darn boring. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's just so fake. Anyway, thank you for watching or listening. Leave a review, hit subscribe, do all that kind of stuff. Cheers.